All right. Welcome back, folks, from your long weekend. I hope you guys had a great one. Um, I'm excited to be able to have our speaker today for our Life Beyond PhD series. I will be starting with a little bit of introductions in terms of administrative stuff, and we'll jump right into it. So just a heads up, if you don't know me, my name is Joanne. I'm the Program Director for Graduate Professional Success for STEM PhDs and Postdocs, GPS STEM for short. We really focus in on helping prepare our STEM scientists at UCI for a variety of different careers within the STEM workforce and really help you guys to not only just become skilled scientists, but also polished professionals. And we really work to help create, identify, and support different types of approaches to help broaden your you know, graduate and postdoctoral training. So today, the Life Beyond PhD series really showcases different STEM workforce careers and really celebrating the end of one journeys. And these are fireside types of chats really intended to be informal, casual, and give you guys, the current PhDs and postdoc trainees, a chance to be able to explore various careers, identify those critical skills that you need in order to be successful now and in your training, but also further down the line when you are transitioning into your next role, wherever you are in your current uh, program. And really give you a chance to connect with those in industries that you're interested in. Format-wise, administrative announcements here, wrapping that up, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our speaker. He will be sharing a little bit about his uh, transition from PhD into where he is now, as well as sort of the obstacles, learned lessons, um, and advice that he has for current trainees, and then finally opening up to Q&A and ind individual networking if we have time. It's a little bit quiet in the chat. Um, I'm happy to fill in that gap with some questions that I've prepared previously. But without further ado then, I'm happy to go ahead and introduce our speaker today, Dr. Avid Najmadi. He has earned his master's and PhD in material sciences at UC Irvine, um, and he has held various types of industry roles in the medical device field, particularly the project development engineer role, product technical lead, and he's now a senior engineer advancing the technology at Dexcom, looking at continuous glucose monitoring systems for diabetes management in San Diego, California. I'm actually going to keep it incredibly brief because uh, Dr. Najamadi is going to share a little bit more about where he's been, where he's going, um, and some advice there. So I will pass it to you now. Go ahead and share your screen if you'd like. Thank you so much, Joanne. Let me share my screen. Yeah, and thanks, thanks to everyone for coming in. Thanks to Joanne for putting this thing together. I think it's pretty cool that we can get together with UCI folks. Uh, if there's anything I can help with, I would be happy to. Um, I have a couple of slides I'm going to go over. I'm trying to share my screen right now. So my background, I grew up in Iran, north of Iran, close to Caspian Sea. That is a lake that people call sea because it's huge. Um, it connects to Russia on north end and at the south end, it's Iran. That's where the expensive caviar comes from. It's not too expensive in Iran, but when you import it to US, it becomes extremely expensive. Um, the reason is that fish is an endangered species. So it's, it's really weird if you want to bring any of that caviar to United States. They, grow, they, they usually toss it in front of you. Um, so I did my undergrad at the University of Tehran. You can see the symbol here. The background was material science, but I really wanted to work on biomedical engineering related research. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, in material science department, there was only a few projects that were somewhat related to biomedical engineering, and I chose the best one that I could. It was working on biomedical titanium alloys that are being used in dental implants and hip implants and inside a body. So what I ended up doing was taking some of this alloy, doing some testing, mechanical testing, understanding the characteristics, the changes, and then publishing it in a paper. Um, that paper really helped me. It was materials design. At the time, the impact factor was not that high up, but it has been going up, and I've been getting citations there. So that paper kind of helped me to get into UC Irvine because it was very difficult to get to a graduate program when he applied from Iran. For some reason, um, University of Tehran was, is not as recognized here as it is over there. Uh, hopefully that will change in the future. 
So I got into material science department, uh, which was joined with chemical engineering at the time. We were in the engineering tower. I think we are somewhere else at this point. Um, hopefully I'll get to find that new location and come visit soon. So I joined material science department and I was looking for finding a, an opportunity to work on, again, medical engineering, biomedical engineering and materials that are used in developing medical devices. Um, I think it was one year in when I was able to join a lab, um, Professor Lakey, that was starting a team. And he, we had him come from University of Alberta to UC Irvine at the time. It was very close to his arrival. Uh, and he was working on pancreatic islets that are used to basically create insulin and technologies related to reversing diabetes with using pancreatic islets. I joined his lab and from there, I deviated into working in biomedical engineering lab and I joined Professor Botswinik's lab in biomedical engineering. These are the names I worked with during my material science PhD and masters, which was mostly biomedical engineering to my understanding. So in brief, Mostly during my master's, I worked on medical devices that can house pancreatic islets. These cells, if they are used correctly and implanted inside a host, can create insulin and help with diabetes. I have some backup slides on this right after this. And I also worked on non-invasive oxygen measurement technologies. This technology has become important because when the cells are implanted inside body, they often die because of lack of oxygen and other factors. So it was a really fun project. It started from around 2013 all the way to 2015, 2016. But at the time when we were working with Professor Botfinning and Professor Lakey, there was an opportunity for me to join a startup that Professor Botfinning had in his lab. Um, and I started working on that from 2014, but around 2016, I was fully pivoted into that startup work, which was basically making multi-analyte biosensors. Um, so utilizing the technology we had developed for measuring oxygen, now we were able to put together a sensor that can measure glucose, that can measure lactate, that can measure O2. This is pretty cool because you can measure glucose and help diabetic patients. You can measure lactate and go into hospital markets and help people that have sepsis. And you can measure O2 for a variety of purposes. So the topic of the work was making lots of traction, and that was majority of my thesis work. My thesis was finished in 2018, and the title was Tissue Engineering and Biosensing Towards Cure and Control of Diabetes. It resulted in one patent and a couple of publications, and it was all in me working within a startup setting, which was really fun. And we finished clinical studies as well. So the, the experience was really rewarding. And around that time, and I think this may be an interesting topic of conversation for folks that are international students or um, come from other countries or just like for curiosity in general, um, I use this academic achievements to basically create a case that says, the skills that I have developed working on these technologies uh, are helpful to United States, basically. There is a category of applying for permanent residency that if you can prove your abilities based on your publications, based on strong recommendation letters, based on patents, um, you can apply for green card. So I did that application, I think in 2019 and early 2020, I think it was accepted. I may be off by a couple months, but it was around that time. Then I really wanted to know what goes into developing a <clears throat> biomedical product that can sell in millions. Because it's one thing to develop something within a lab and have really good papers. It can be a nature paper with lots of publication. It's one other thing to develop something within a startup and get grants and expand your work. It's a completely different game if you wanna have a product that you sell to millions of people. So that was that was why I was so curious to join a company that works on this. So it was a very easy transition for me because I was already working on developing biosensors and I joined Dexcom. And Kevin, I'm in Dexcom from 2020. And Dexcom is, 
one of the two leading companies that are developing continuous glucose monitors. As of right now, one and a half million people wear Dexcom sensors around the clock. So that's the population of San Diego. Uh, so they wear it every single day. The data of their glucose trends goes to cloud, goes to our algorithm team. Everything is analyzed. There's a really huge data set of how these people are doing. And this is just expanding. This is just a fraction of the market. Um, and it really tied into my previous work. And recently, I've been thinking that I have, I've done a good job. I mean, there's no end to understanding technical details, but I've had a good amount of time to work on it, plus 10 years at this point. Now I want to understand what goes into marketing, what goes into basically selling and creating money, what goes into commercialization, what are the other details of running a medical device uh, company. So I've started uh, pursuing my evening program MBA at UC San Diego. The classes are Tuesday and Thursday. It's a huge commitment in terms of both time and money because you have to pay some portion of the tuition. tuition. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to it. That will end in 2026. This is my whole background, where I started, where I am right now, living in San Diego. Um, I have a couple of slides that go through what diabetes is, why these technologies are important. It will probably take me only a few minutes, so I'll just go through them quickly. I'm guessing some of the folks already know all of this stuff, so I'll just be very brief. Um, so diabetes in general, both type 1 and type 2, is a disease characterized by elevated levels of blood glucose. So for some reason, your body cannot maintain a control level of glucose. In type 1 diabetes, you have an autoimmune uh, disease. That's why it happens in kids as well. So your immune system comes and destroys those cells that are responsible for creating insulin. And for type 2, those cells become insensitive over time because of consumption of sugar and some other factors. So you don't necessarily inherit it. You develop that. Uh, the care and treatment, or you should probably re reward that. The treatment that is used mostly is using blood to measure glucose. You can see it in this picture. And then you measure it with like a meter and you inject insulin based on your understanding of your body, what your body is going to do with the amount of insulin, what time of day it is, what kind of food you have, it's good, but it's imperfect because, well, we have so much technology right now. There are algorithms that can develop things. There are technologies that can make it hands-free so you don't have to worry about it. If you are, if you have a child or if you are a three-year-old, you probably cannot make this decision. If you have a three-year-old, it's very difficult. Uh, so there are some alternative approaches. I started from here uh, when I joined UC Irvine, and I'm very grateful because uh, I think this is a pathway to actually curing diabetes. And it's not just, at this point, it's not just research. There are huge pharmaceutical companies working on this. So basically, the understanding is, if you can have the cells that create insulin and you can hide them from the immune system, you can implant them inside a host and they will create insulin and that host will not have diabetes problems anymore. And it is this uh, drawing on top shows it, but the limitations are obviously the immune system is going to attack the cells that are not from that body, and they may die from lack of oxygen because they're not vasculatures around them, they were not developed within the body, and they will die. Their approaches, one of them is creating a medical device that is capable of producing, uh, capable of transferring oxygen, uh, that's shown to the right. So you basically insert the cells inside the device and you implant the device. There's another approach in which you wrap a protective polymer around the cells and then you insert them. Just a fun fact, a couple of years ago, um, Vertex Pharmaceuticals bought this startup for $1 billion in cash from Harvard. And now they're expanding fast. Uh, last year, they also buy, bought Viacite, which is which was another big startup in San Diego. And they're all merged at this point. A couple of different startups bought really, put a lot of money. So this technology, when it's ready, is going to be life-changing. Um, 
And this is something I'm doing right now. So in parallel to that technology, which is basically changing cells, um, you have technology that can measure glucose continuously. It's like a piece of wire or a piece of substrate that goes underneath the skin. You have polymers, you have enzymes, and you get a signal, and then you convert that signal to the glucose level. You can see a Dexcom package on top. This is G7. This is a packet for G7. A smartwatch that also connects with Dexcom. A phone that has a Dexcom app, so all the information is in cloud. You get continuous readings of glucose. There's very deep algorithm to predict what the glucose level is going to be. Uh, it can help people in terms of telling them how much insulin to insert manually, or it can also connect to an insulin pump through the cloud. And you can see pictures here. This, this person here has a G6 on the stomach, Omnipod on the leg. So they communicate with each other. If, if this person eats a lot of carbs through the cloud, this Omnipod is going to know and it's going to inject insulin and the level of glucose is going to come down. While it's coming down, the glucose sensor is going to read it and they're going to moderate it. So that's what I'm working on right now. Uh, working on next generations of continuous glucose monitoring to make it better, also measure other things. Um, I think I can pause it here. This is this is where where I am right now. If you guys have any questions, please there let is, me know. There is a question in the chat from Shin. Shin asks, do you have your patent granted by the time when you apply for the per permanent citizenship? Also, how long does that take for your patent submission to be granted? That's a really good question. No, the patent was submitted, I think, 2018, and it's not granted yet. It takes a while for patents to, to be granted. We've had, we filed our response to the, uh, to the examiner, and we're still waiting. So the patent status is pending. Um, what was the rest of the question? Sorry, I've, I've lost the chat somewhere. Let me stop sharing. I think you answered that question. The, se okay. the second part of the question was how long does that patent submission take? Um, okay. um, the submission as in putting it together and working with the UCI team to submit it probably takes around six months to a year. It really helps if you are diligent and you give them information, but usually patent attorneys have their own time. Uh, a lot of it is because they charge you based on the time they spent but it takes around a year to file a patent and it takes five years or more to get it granted. For applying for permanent residency, the patent was helpful, but more than that, um, publications and the citations helped. Is it number of publications? The number of publications factor? as well as the number of citations are, are really important. So if you can showcase that you have a paper that has been cited so certain number of times um, by different people that work on similar technologies, that really helps. So something that you mentioned earlier um, was about startups being really fun. And that's kind of unique where you actually got to see the startup side of it. Um, can you share a little bit more about that experience? And um it sounded like Dexcom became a really good fit for you afterwards as a more larger, more established company. Yeah, that's a really good question. Startups are really fun. I mean, I have to, I have to also mention that the startup I worked at was from the same lab that I worked at, and it was a university spun startup. So it may be very different if you join a startup in Silicon Valley that's not a university spun startup. It may become much faster and much more competitive uh, because when you are within a university setting, you're not as worried about basically paying for the bills. Um, not as worried, you still are, but the, the, the setting is a little different. The reason the startup period for me was super fun was you get to do so many things. From calling the vendor to putting together the sensor by your hand to writing down the IRB. So like you wear so many different hats, but when you're within industry, especially a larger company, the your role is very defined. So if you wanna do your role and do extra, that's great, but that extra is going to be hard to do because you, then you'll be overstepping other people's boundaries. So there's a lot of that bureaucracy and limits in a in the larger setting, and obviously lack of time. 
Very true. Thank I'll you. have I have a question from Nina. What is your advice for applying to jobs in industry? That's a really good. That's a really good question. Um, connections. I like. I, I can give you all the answers that you already know. That you fit, make your resume nice, and you send it to two hundred people, and then you change the resume based on the job application. I mean, that works. Uh, you create a good resume that fits that particular role you want to uh, apply to. So resume for each application should be different, uh, and it needs to answer questions they're looking for. Um, on top of that, you need to have, you need to work on developing a certain level of connection. So if you know someone from that particular company that you want to apply to, reach out to them, ask who the hiring manager is, ask what they're looking for, share the resume with them through offline channels, LinkedIn, email, and then have them or ask them to share it with the hiring manager. This oftentimes helps tremendously um, because when we when we put a role for the XCOM, we get hundreds of applicants, and they're strong applicants. So this is very easy to just miss a good applicant. Um, this really helps. There's another question from Hasti. Did you want to unmute and ask yours for yourself? Yeah, sure. I can do that. Hi. Um... Yeah, my question was a little long, but I can try to uh, summarize it. It was about, um, my question was about your mess, you studying business uh, and also working full time. Uh, I wonder in general, uh, first of all, how challenging have you found that so far? I don't, I, I'm not sure if I, if you're still doing it or not. And the second, uh, is that something that your company or your boss or people who are you are working for full time? need to approve uh, and is it possible that sometimes they don't allow something like that or that's like you are off time and it's like not up to them at all well just curious want to see how likely it is to be able to do that do that like practically when we yeah, get a full-time job yeah thank you that's a really good question thank you for asking you it definitely i mean i'm starting the business school right now but i've talked to so many people that have done this and there are not a lot of people that have done PhD and that they're doing business um, but I've talked to a lot of people it it probably will take around 20 to 25 hours a week on average which could be challenging if you have a 40 hour uh, work but it's not challenging when you think about the life of a PhD student, to be honest with you. So 60 hours is nothing. So as long as I maintain that mentality of my grad school, I should be fine. This is my understanding. Um, but yeah, definitely it's going to be a challenge. It's going to impact your personal life for around three years. Um, is this something that your company and boss need to approve? I would say so. Because this could potentially impact your availability. Um, even though this is an evening program or a weekend program. My advice is if somebody wants to do this, they they should develop a really strong communication with their supervisors within the industry way beforehand uh, and, and say, this is one of my aspirations. I want to do this thing. And these are the reasons that this will help us because I'll have an understanding of leadership. I'll have an understanding of financial um aspects i'll have i can bring in more connections from different parts of the industry so it needs to be argument that's convincing to get their approval that's what i would suggest and is it related to them it could be it could be especially if you're working in um advanced tech r d that i'm working you will basically be working with technologies that will come out in five to ten years so there are departments and teams that look into the market for those technologies because it doesn't exist yet. They they go through surveys, they go through deep understandings, there are people that do venture capitalist kind of work here or in any big company. So being able to wear different hats could be, could be really helpful. Um, I think I addressed the, the topics. Yes, thank you. I have a follow-up question, but if there's time at the end, I will just ask. 
Thank sure. you. Mm -hmm. I think the next question I see in chat is from Ting Wei. Ting Wei, did you want to unmute and ask? If not, I can read it. How did you start the idea of making the project into an actual startup? Did you get advice from your academic advisor at that time? It sounded like it was a startup that was already going, right? That's what I was going to say. This was a startup that was already going, and it went through different pivots. So it had a different name. It went through some funding issues. This is 2014 to 2016, and 2016, it was deformatted at a different startup. And all the credit goes to the team I started working with and Professor Botswanik, because we was, he is very entrepreneurial. Um, but this is not only the case within the lab I worked on. I've had friends from UC Irvine, from different places that really pioneered all the work. They made the connections within the university. It's a really great setting. At UC Irvine, for example, you have the innovation at UC Irvine hub, incubation center. There, there's it's a really cool building. I forgot the name. Um, there's a lot of resources you could use. There's a lot of people that have developed startups, and there are professors that have entrepreneurial experiences. I would say if you have a good idea, uh, reach out to them and discuss them. But I have to make this also a, uh, I have to note this as well. Be very careful with sharing your idea. Uh, because if you send an email with your idea to a professor at UC Irvine, which I love that the university will own the idea. So if you want to do it within university, I, I, I would highly suggest it because they're super supportive. But before going there, make sure you understand all the legal constraints and how you would share it, who you would share it with. Um, I, I suggest reaching out to the right people within the Innovation Center. Maybe we can find some resources for you afterwards. We'll have to work with Joanne to find what that team was. I think it was be all applied innovation, the Cove area. If you're yeah. doing wet lab stuff, ULP is really great. I definitely agree. If you are using any type of UCI resources, emails included, UCI has potential to actually claim your IP if you want to do your own startup separate from academia and the lab space. That said, we'll add one more comment to, you know, how do you decide if it's a good idea? Um, customer discovery, interviewing potential customers, seeing is there an actual market, who is actually going to buy your product, and is the pain point that you are addressing truly the pain point that people feel, or are you just building a technology because you happen to fall into that category? So ensuring that your solution, it's called a product market fit, that's the last thing I will add on that, but I totally agree in terms of making sure that um, getting your boxes checked legally, if, depending on where you want to go with that startup. Yeah, thank you so much, John. I think this was a great addition to it. The next question from Yi Xin. Uh, what kind of connections is considered good in terms of connecting uh, for applying for a job? And I think this goes back to your recommendation for networking. I think any connection is good. I think if you go to a conference, talk to as many people as you can, see what they do, connect with them on LinkedIn, LinkedIn send them emails, send them follow-up emails. If you go to a to any location that you have a chance to connect with people, um, talk to them, see what they do. It, they could be in anywhere, any sort of industry that's related to you. It doesn't have to be, because oftentimes when we do a PhD or postdoc, we are doing something very niche, but when you go into a industrial setting, you may start from that niche thing, but then you can go to something that's completely different because the skill sets that you've developed is transferable. So that connection you may be talking to is working in aerospace. I've had, had friends like that. Um, could be working in a medical device company three years from now. So connect with them, understand what they do, tell them what you do, and maintain the connections with follow-ups, emails, if you have like, and achieve and share it with them. Uh, I've I've always valued that. 
I think those are a really good recommendation. You never know who is going to be your future employer, your future employee, or your best friend. (laughs) So keep that open for yourself. Um, In terms of another question that I have lined up here, um, I'm curious, what does your day-to-day look like now that you've transitioned into industry? I've heard a lot of stereotypes about a lot of meetings, different types of questions that you're asking as opposed to the ones that you might have asked during your PhD. Are there similar or are there different? What does that look like for you? That's a really good question. Um, The level of interaction you have with other people goes up when you work in a company in an industrial setting. So whereas PhD is mostly individual work, And then you have chances of sharing your results with your advisor and other folks every once in a while. Here within a company, you need to sit in different meetings and understand about other topics that are ongoing and other projects. So a lot of your day-to-day life would be to understand the priority of your work and understanding the other priorities and other parallel work so you don't step on the wrong foot or you get along with different people. That is a big change. In terms of day-to-day life, there is a portion of it, and it has been changing for me slowly over time. There's a portion of it that focuses on similar to PhD work, at least in this level I am at, which is understanding the experimentation and data settings. I think at this point, I'm around 20 to 30% there. It has been shrinking, which is kind of unfortunate, but I think that happens. Some portion of the work, I would say around 50% is to make sure um, the projects I'm leading are moving forward. And oftentimes there's seven to eight different people from seven to eight different departments that are working on it. So it's a lot of one-on-ones, a lot of checkpoints, a lot of milestones. And 20 to 30% of the work is, I would say 20% or 15% of the work is making sure everything is aligned aligned for the long-term goals maybe 15%, then 15% is reading about what's going to be next. So that's like 10 to 15% of your time that you'd be thinking about, at least I, I dedicate that time, but what to do next, what to, what, what were you going to develop in the next five years? Um, I think that that's my breakdown. It's good to hear, especially about the future facing. I feel like we do that a lot from PhD perspective of seeing what's new, what's going on, how do I incorporate, how do I advance? Yeah. The next question that we had is from Navid. Uh, any advice for postdocs wishing to make a transition to industry, but have earned their PhDs outside of the U.S.? And I guess maybe, Navid, if you wanted to add some more uh, implication to that, is it because the value of the education is lower or what do you, like, what's the, what's the barrier for you? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I was just asking in the perspective of uh, the kind of value you get you having your PhD from U.S. soil than the PhD outside of U.S. Uh, I mean, that's the main perspective I would like to ask for. Thank you. Nabil, if you don't mind me asking. Oh, I have a theory. You have a PhD and then we see two year, second year postdoc. Okay. Um, that's a really good question. But I don't think it would be necessarily limiting. I totally understand that if you have a degree from US, it, and it's even easier if you are from US. I, I admit that. Um, but postdoc is also a great opportunity. If you are working on a project that has industry applications, that postdoc can give you a, uh, a, a place to use for building really valuable connections. You'll be going to conferences, you'll be going to uh, expos, you'll you'll be out there with that postdoc, with publications. I, I would I would say use that opportunity to connect with as many people that work on similar topics within industry and connect with them and see what they're working on and kind of understand if you really want to switch to, to industry, um, what kind of application you'll be targeting and what kind of other skill sets you would need to use. Um, I don't think it's limiting. I have coworkers that have done P 
PhDs in other countries and they have done postdocs in the United States for a couple of years with really strong publications, very strong track record, and they've used that uh, and the connections of their advisors to get into the external or other countries. Uh, sorry, other, other companies. Um, it may be a little bit challenging, but I would say uh, you, you can really utilize that postdoc in your benefit. I'm curious, um, Evan, are you on are you on the hiring committees? Are you working with hiring managers for Dexcom? Um depends. If you get someone in our team that goes through rounds of interviews, we we interview them oftentimes. Uh, but I'm not in a hiring committee capacity. Okay. So when you're interviewing, you know, what are some qualities that you look for? Um to see if they're a good candidate or not? That's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> and you need to keep in mind, I come from a PhD background. So oftentimes when I do an interview, I go through, and this is a trick I do, a lot of other people do as well. You go and find something that they have done, maybe in their PhD, maybe in their master's, maybe in their previous work. And just jump deep into asking questions and then follow up questions up until a point that they can answer questions or they can admit they don't know. I think the, the the fact that you can go deep and have an intellectual conversation without having your guards up and being comfortable with knowing or mentioning what you know and you don't know really is helpful. And that's something I use. Other than that, you want to understand how they work within a team. Um, so these are the two things I usually check. That's really good to hear. And I've definitely heard and seen that as well from other colleagues who are taking sort of a deep dive into, can I just have a conversation with this person? What are sort of, how do they tick and how do they think? Yeah, yeah. So on my end, I don't have any additional questions that I have. Is there any more questions up in the chat? I don't see any other questions. Um, I think Hasty mentioned he she has a follow up question. Maybe you can address that. Yeah, Hasty, are you still with us? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, my question, uh, kind of related to what you mentioned about, um, you know, your manager being on the same page as like if you're doing like, you know, for other programs or things. I think one um, general. Um, uh, worry, I guess, that I have looking for jobs other than finding a job, which is my first worry. The second one is finding a good manager that is uh, on the same page in terms of my personal growth, um, like just allowing me to have opportunities. And for example, if I want to go, let's say, get an MBA, they would be, you know, not against it, at least. Um, but I've been hearing from my friends who have recently uh, went to, you know, industry that a lot of the times their managers are not really um, helpful in that sense. I guess there's different types of people, I guess. And I mean, I can't really speak to that uh, specific um, cases. I haven't experienced that myself. But I mean, other than just talking and interviewing, because I know that like one of the goals of interview process is for the applicant also to ask questions and make sure they're on the same page. Uh, that being said, uh, with the current situation of the market, I can try to do that to some extent, but I just wondering like if I have that ability to like choose a manager, like what qualities, what what is something that I can like you would recommend that I look into um, so that I can have a supportive <laughs> manager. I think that's really important to me. Again, I don't know how likely it is for me to have that ability to pick. Uh, maybe I don't, especially for the first few jobs. Um, but yeah, any insights would be very helpful. Thank you. No, thank you for asking this question. That's a really great question. Um, you, you said it correctly. Um, the first job may be more challenging because you want to get your foot in the door. So you, you oftentimes people don't have that much leverage to pick and choose, especially if they're on visa programs. Um, but during the interview, there are opportunities to assess. 
uh, what the deal is like. It's a little bit different if you are within industry, you already have a job, and then you're looking at your options, and if they give you a bad response, you'll be like, no, I'm kind of hesitant. Uh, but every person that interviews you will ask towards they should. If they don't, you can tell them. They should give you around five minutes back over 30 minutes for you to ask questions. And one of the questions you can ask is, how do you like working within your team? They will probably say, well, I like it. But you can ask uh, if there was one thing you you could change uh, within the work dynamic you are, what would it be? Um, and then get this perspective from different people within the team. Mm -hmm. And also, if you interview the hiring manager, ask them, what is your input on career progression and how much do you value personal growth? I mean, word it nicely. They most likely will say we really value it. But you, when you get this pr from different perspectives, especially from people that are not directly working with a hiring manager, you can get the overall understanding of um, how it's going to be. It's a hit or miss. Bad managers are really terrible. Good managers are perfect. A good manager would not micromanage you, especially when you come from a good background. And they will allow you to um, basically grow. Um, and one of the things I highly suggest is if you apply to a company that's a large company and you know someone inside that company or you have a connection in LinkedIn that has a connection within that company, reach out to them and talk to them over the phone and get their feedback. I've done this before as well. Um, and it doesn't have to be a direct connection. It can be a connection of a connection that would introduce you. Just reach out to them and say, hey, I'm going through interviews. I may most likely get this job within this role. I want to give your honest feedback. And they're not going to be responsible for your interview, so they can give you more honest feedback. Um, hopefully that helps. I know that that period is very stressful. Thank you. Yeah, of course. We have a comment from me about sort of uh, assessing the company culture is directly asking about how's the company culture. I've I've seen that sometimes fall a bit vague because folks can kind of hide behind, well, this is our mission and this is our group. Um, so just I'm just curious if uh, there was a more specific question there. Something that I know that I've seen to be effective is to ask directly of, um, you know, when someone has not been successful, when someone has made a mistake, how do you, the team go about dealing with that? Or how do you recover from something like that? How was the person treated? Can you give me an example of how that looked like? Um, I don't know if you have any other questions that you like to ask, Abid. Um, I, I would just add this. Keep in mind when you're applying to a role and interviewing with me and a couple other people, there's always more applicants for that role. So we'll be interviewing four or five different people for that role. And there are other roles as well. So we'll be interviewing 20, 30 people. And if I don't like the culture of my company, mm -hmm. which I do, but if it's a company I don't like the culture, I'm not going to go ahead and tell 30 different people that the culture is terrible because it's going to backfire. And somebody's going to know that I'm saying this. So you need to be a little bit clever, I would say. Uh, to understand what's going on. So you probably want to address it differently. Just just put them in a position to say, hypothetically, if you wanted to change or if you become a manager yourself, what would you do differently? Put them in a position to give you feedback that could be helpful. Um, yeah, yeah, that's my input here. That's actually a really good uh, hypothetical question to give. Yeah. Um, the next question um, from Nagar, are internships during PhD helpful in getting a job in the future? If yes, what kind of companies should we choose to intern for? Do you, you know, as a person from the hiring side, do you see those as valuable for a PhD yeah. or is yeah, PhD they're sufficient? definitely valuable. This is this is a really great question. When I was doing my PhD, I didn't do internship, and when you come as an uh, international student, you really don't have that much of leverage. And saying, hey, I'm going to be gone for three months. Um, so, or if you're like a PhD student, sometimes you need to have a really clear understanding of what it takes for you to be gone for a couple months during summer, somewhere else. But they're definitely very helpful. You build really good connections. 
if you do a really good job, you have a very good chance of getting into that company. So when it comes to the application times, you can focus on that company and multiple other companies. And then if you have multiple different offers, you can leverage them to get a, to get like, it's not just about pay, um, to get, to be able to negotiate what you want. Um, so definitely if you have an opportunity, depending on your PhD project, to do internship, do it. But keep in mind, doing internship oftentimes may result in a PhD that may last longer. So it's very different from case to case. Um, but these are the factors you want to uh, think about. Really good to hear. Um, another question from Mina. Do most companies have visa support for international applicants? I don't know if you've been able to see sort of a broader perspective in the time that you were applying. Yeah, some companies have, have this. Larger companies have this. Uh, I would say companies do have visa support for international applicants. They, they get H-1B, which is a work visa for you. Uh, and then if you're doing a good job, you can perhaps apply for green card through the company as well. That's a very good route for um, getting permanent residency. I would suggest, however, to really utilize that OPT period because when you're in STEM and you get your PhD, you can get an OPT extension up to three years. That's the easiest path forward, forward until you you find certain details. But to answer qu your question, yes. Excellent. All righty. I don't see any other questions in chat as we're rounding out the last 10 minutes. Um, if there are no more questions, we can wrap up here and let folks ask individual ones when we're off sort of the recording. But please, everyone, go ahead and give a thank you to our speaker today. Really appreciate you taking time out of your workday to be able to speak with us.